This is today a uniquely personal sermon. I don't preach a lot like this. I generally, you guys have known me well enough, we usually start with open your Bibles to such and such, usually Luke, as it's been for the last year. But today, I wanted to personally talk to everyone here, maybe those joining us online, who like the, like the idea of Jesus. They like Christianity, they like the songs, they like the guy who waves his arms a lot on stage, maybe. But they're still not sure about putting their life in the hands of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is not just something to flip on on a Sunday morning on a screen. Not something to trot out on holidays or funerals or weddings or other convenient religious times. But Jesus is Lord who must be worshipped as everything or not at all. Who will not abide by being just a little part of your life. And so today I want to I wanna just take you through what I find compelling, like how I arrived at the point where I worship Jesus Christ and following him is the highest good in my life. Because I, I am not, I'm not naturally a believer of things. And there's certain people, they have like a gift of faith and they just like grab on, believe things because I'm more naturally wired to be a skeptic. Everyone who's ever tried to convince me of something knows this. My wife more than anyone else. <laughs> Actually, my wife and salesman. I, so I, before I was pastor here and I'm still involved uh, at my family's dairy farm and I, I drove salesmen crazy. I don't know if this is like the greatest thing. And Andrew's not here, but because I just, every salesman rolls up on my yard and they've got something that's going to be cheap, easy, and it's going to make me money no matter what. Now, I know that not all of these things can make me money because some of them are mutually contradictory. And so, and so I'm just... I'm just naturally wired to say, no, I don't think it's going to work. You know, my brothers were always, for like two years, they were always fascinated by these teat scrubber things. So, so there, there's a little like thing, you put it up, and it's got these brushes that spin, and they clean the cow's teats, which was a different new way. And they were all like, wow, it looks so good, and the video's so cool. And I was always just like, ah, oh, those things are going to break. And so I always said, no, we shouldn't buy these things. No, we shouldn't buy these things. So I... Uh, when I accepted the call to being pastor here, my brothers went out and bought all the stuff that I told them not to buy. <laughs> and now, those teeth scrubbers, they sit in a pile in some discarded corner because they broke for the, too many times and nobody wanted to fix them anymore. And so, yeah, I'm skeptical of new things. I live my life by the motto of Proverbs 18:17. The one who states his case first seems right until another comes and examines him. And it's like everything always seems so good when somebody's saying it, but you have to figure out what the other side is and argue it. I always like to come up with, and uh, the other elders know this, is whenever we have a new idea for something, I say, so... Two years from now, this has totally failed in every way. Why has it failed? And then we have to think, sit there and think of reasons why this is going to be a bad idea. And hopefully we can figure that out before we make the mistake for real. I also grew up in the internet age. 
And the internet has made life a little different in terms of who can I trust? You know what? I'm, I'm old enough, so I'm old enough to know, to remember the days when to get the news, we flipped on one of two channels at six o'clock at night and a very nice looking upstanding guy from a desk told me exactly what was going on in the world. And if I didn't believe him, I could go to the other guy who's sitting at a different, slightly looking desk, maybe with a different tie, who told me basically the same thing. <laughs> Life was so easy then, I just believed the guy with the nice tie and uh, everything was nice. But now, I scroll through my Facebook page or whatever other page you can go through, or Twitter, and you can get your facts, you can get your alternative facts, you can get your satire jokes that look like facts but really aren't, you can get your Russian misinformation sent out to confuse me and vote for a different person set of facts, and all of these competing against each other that just seem to shout louder, make cooler memes, and I'm like, what in the world should I believe? I sometimes get a little dismayed when I, I see people and they're like, oh, why are you sharing that? That's so false. But, but it's hard. Like everybody's out there trying to grab your attention with a, a cool story and a, and a very earnest sounding, sounding uh, story on, on a YouTube channel. So why believe? Now, as I grew up, the first thing I, I discovered was I, I went to school. My parents sent me off to public school, and I went to university, and, and I learned there, trust the facts. Trust the experts. You open up a textbook, and you get the answer to the question. And there's a, a certain, like, truth to this. Like, I want an expert fixing my car, usually. <laughs> Don't worry, dear, I'm going to fix that other problem. <laughs> when, our, when our bathroom drain is clogged, like we want someone who knows what they're doing unclogging it because we don't want all of that mess just going into our basement or something. And there's a certain cachet to trusting experts. But then again, I, I wonder what experts to, to trust. You know, there are experts who will tell me I'm descended from a monkey. There are experts on the news, and they'll tell me one side of the story, but I kind of know, hey, here's this expert, but they're working for this think tank that's getting all of their money from a certain thing. I'm like, well, boy, an expert that's just getting all their money from a certain side, that doesn't really seem like a good thing. And you, you can see in all of the ways that experts, either from presuppositions, or experts that disagree with other experts. And even more, experts can be terribly wrong with deadly consequence. Who built the Chernobyl reactor? Experts. Experts built it. They're like, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. Remember back in the 90s, this is a funny thing, Back in the 90s, there were a lot of people who, who had this business. Uh, do you guys, anybody remember PMU Farms? Somebody just reminded you. Yeah, pregnant knit mare urine. You know why they had literal horse farms collecting horse pee? Like this was a business. <laughs> because the experts said, boy, menopause is really hard for women. How about we just keep pumping them full of estrogen? That'll work well. Uh, apparently, in the 90s, they discovered pumping people full of hormones was a bad idea. Now the experts say other things, but anyways. 
A bunch of people got cancer and died because we listened to the experts. So if just listening to the experts doesn't work and you see oh, on the news they're all getting paid by somebody, what do you do? Now, as I grew up, and I grew up going into the internet age, I came to a point, and it's a point I see this, I see this in young men all over, and it's nihilism. It's the thought, one person says this, one person says that. I don't know what's true, and I don't care. I'm just going to live for right now and do what feels good. I'm just going to live for pleasure and live for sex and entertainment and feeling good just for the moment. I'm going to make funny memes. I'm just going to sit back, make fun of everything. You know, you never get in, tr you know, you know, it's really easy to sit back and just poke fun at other ideas if you never have to actually say what you believe. It's easy to be the jokester. But then again, there's part of me that could never accept this. Because, again, child of the 90s, I grew up like Mulder, knowing like the truth is out there. Like there was something in me that said, like there is this truth that is out there somewhere. I can feel that there is something solid. I might know exactly what it is, but there is something solid out there. And then, you know, you start to think maybe if I can't, like, trust people out there, if I can't trust the experts, maybe, maybe I have to trust myself. Maybe the only truth is what is in me. <laughs> My truth. <laughs> Believe in yourself also. Grew up in the 90s. This kind of intuitionalism, and there's a certain part of it that's right. I mean, there was that thing in me that felt like there was something true out there. And this does actually get back to the, to the Bible, that there is only one way. And we know things because each human being was created in the image of God. We feel this urge to worship something bigger than ourselves, give our lives to a cause bigger than just ourselves, because ultimately we were created in God's image. That every atom of our being cries out and says that there's something greater than me. Now, this also fails because you can really feel like you know the truth and you understand it, but then you talk to another person and they feel something totally different. They're like, why don't you feel the truth? I know the truth here. But then they're like, but I know the truth here and they disagree. And how can both of these truths co comp coexist and furthermore if you've ever talked to a teenager you know <laughs> this is true for adults but in teenagers we can generally see it better that they will tell you oh I just feel this is true so deep down inside of me this is like the truth I feel it this is the the doctrine of sola feels But if you actually look at what they're telling you, this wasn't some transcendent truth dropped to them from the sky. They're telling you exactly what their TikTok star was telling you. Now, by the way, the same thing is true for boomers, except it's like what Fox News is telling you, but don't. Uh. <laughs> so many of these things that we think that we are feeling deep down inside of us are actually just the result of outside influences turning us whichever way. It's obvious to see in others 
We're often blind to our own faults. Now, for myself, I found out intuitional reasoning was deeply flawed. Because when I just followed what I felt, it led me to disaster. It led me to be a jerk to people because it's like, oh, I know best. I'm the, I'm the wise person. Like, you know, that pride led me into sexual depravity. You know, it's like, well, it looks good to, you know, look at naked women online. Like, why don't go to do that? And yet all of this fails ultimately because it takes you to dark places. And so our intuitional reasoning is flawed because we're sinners. Now, if all of these sources of information, experts, nihilism, intuitionalism fail, why then trust this 2,000-year-old book? A dusty book, got lots of crazy stuff in it, you know, donkeys talking, things like that. And for myself coming at it, you know, this is just me, I think the first thing is this world, you know, look at it, is too good to be chance. It's too good to be chance. I often say, like, my, my only apologetic is bacon. I was like, like, really? Have you tasted bacon? Like, you taste the crunchy, sweet, salty on your lips? Like, like how can you deny there's a God when you've had bacon? <laughs> now the evolutionist would reply, well, so, well, Pastor Sir, it's just because of a, an evolutionary response for you to seek salt and fat in order to make you, full, make you well. First, I'm not sure how salt and fat is helping me very much anymore. But secondly, that might work for bacon. But does it work for a sunrise? I mean, you look at the sunrise over the prairie skies, and a billion colors burst into our eyes as we see this beauty just shining down on us in this radiant awesomeness as the field burst forth with a billion blooms and I look out over all of these things and I say wow it's like the transcendence of the beauty of the earth and you're just like really random chance like this is all just like a, a machine working its way with like DNA trying to like seek its own like survive it's like, really, the, the best way for this rose to survive was like that? It's not just like, because it's beautiful? Like, really? You expect me to believe that? <laughs> and so ask me for proof of God, and I will point you to a flour or a double bacon, double cheeseburger. <laughs> Your choice. Both are awesome. Second... I find Jesus uniquely compelling. Now, there have been many great leaders in the world. And they can inspire you with words, they make you stand up and clap. And there's also been some terrible leaders. I've been reading the biography of Abraham Lincoln. And like, Abraham Lincoln was a wizard with words. Like, incredible how that guy could speak. And yet, even if you go through the world's great orators and thinkers and philosophers from Kikoro to Kierkegaard, I am left with the singular uniqueness of Jesus Christ. After all, who, on a, who stands on a mountain and tells peasants who aren't even sure where their next meal is going to come from, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Who says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, and then actually do that in his life? What man stays silent in the midst of the accusations that would condemn him? And what mere mortal refuses to yield even to the grave 
witnessed to by the women as he rose, to the disciples who went from a cowering bunch of cowards to people who would go to their death proclaiming that Jesus is alive, leaving aside the 500 others that he appeared to that Paul tells us of. What other peasant from a backwater province could change the world? It's only one. It's, his name is Jesus. Now you someday are going to be faced, maybe in a hospital room, maybe in a bed. Someday you are going to draw your last breath and you are going to die. Hope it's not today, but maybe. And you are going to die on that day following something. You might as well follow the one person who went to that grave and walked right back out again. Third, the Bible only has one hero, and I find this so compelling. Like, I read the Bible, and, and the skeptics, the skeptics will tell you, like, like, most documents are political documents made to, you know, for the powerful to exploit the weak. But then I read the story, and I'm like, you read the political leaders, and it's like, this David, David, this great leader, you know, it also points out to the fact that, you know, he committed adultery, he murdered. Oh, yeah, and he took a census that almost got, like, the entire nation wiped out by God. Like, if this was the, the, the guy you are supposed to be pumping up, but no. The disciples, and we just read through the Good Friday service, you know, Peter, the, Peter, James, John, all of these people, they're running away. They're afraid. They're denying Jesus. These are the people who wrote the Bible. You know, you could have just, like Peter, he's like, he's dictating this to Mark, who's writing the Gospel of Mark, first Gospel. You think he could have just left out the part where he was denying Jesus? It's like he's not telling a lie. He's just, oh, leave it out a few convenient facts so people don't think he's such a, such a jerk. But no, he writes that because he believes in Jesus Christ, not Peter. And this points to his honesty and the truth of the Bible. And finally, we get back to our main text of the day. If you have a Bible, you can open it to Matthew 28, verse 5. Jesus has a compassionate heart for those who suffer. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There will you, will you see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples and you think that was where the story would end the angel has come given the women all of the relevant information so they can go and do what they need to do and yet at that point something else happens and behold jesus met them and said greetings and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. It wasn't necessary for Jesus to meet the women. He actually didn't tell them anything new. But he met them because he had a compassionate heart. Like, even though they had faith, they were believing, they were going to go do what they were doing, Jesus knew that they still had this fear in their heart, and because of his compassion to them, he shows up, and he spends this one beautiful moment with them where they worship him. And in that moment, he cast away all of their fears, and he spoke right to their heart. Jesus' heart is so compassionate towards every person who suffers, every person in pain, every person who fears, so that he takes this extra time to go right there. Jesus cares for you when you hurt. If you are anxious, you can come to Jesus to soothe your worry for tomorrow, he cares for you. 
If you are fearful, you can come to Jesus' strong hand because he is powerful and able to save you from anything in this world. If you're weighted down with the burdens of sin and the crushing weight of guilt, come to Jesus for his tender mercy because he is forgiving of sinners. And if you are lonely, cut off from people, as too many of us are, come to Jesus' tender heart because he cares for you, not just to some object, but for you, who you are. He is humble and lowly, and his heart cares for you. And ultimately, when I come to Jesus, I come because of him himself, because he's good. I see his heart, and I find my fullest joy there. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, I pray for each person here. And I pray especially for anyone who might be wondering and wandering about this Jesus business. I pray, Lord, here that they would know you. That they would say, Lord God, please save me. Cast away my fear, cast away my anxiety. Cast away my sins, Lord God, I repent of them. And I come to you, Lord Jesus, save me. I cannot save myself. I pray, Lord God, that a person here would say that prayer, they would reach out to you because you are our only hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're listening online, if you're out there and you prayed along with me and you want to know Jesus, uh, I just, you know, reach out. You can use the Facebook Messenger thing if you're watching on Facebook. If you're here, you can come talk to me because following Jesus was about discipleship. Saying a prayer is the first step in a life of following Jesus. I'd like to call up the worship team to lead us.